okay, here we are trying to investigate the world around us uh, through the uh, technology of uh, Zoom and remote uh, talk shows on ThinkTech. And we keep on trucking. We do 40 plus shows a week, just like this. We reach out to everywhere in the world. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding you. Um, and we talk to people who can really elucidate what's happening around us. It's like mm, being aware. Anyway, today we're going to talk about cybersecurity with Randy Minus of the Shiva School of Business, um, who has developed a master's in science program and who can talk to us about not only cybersecurity, but ready, the psychology of cybersecurity. Hi, Randy. Hello. How are you? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, well, I want to. You want to. I want to get into this because I, I have a theory, and I want to bounce it off you that um, COVID is affecting the reliability of our technology systems. You know, we have assumed, um, you know, for example, that our food chain is okay, but the Sauce Brothers, uh, uh, you know, line. Um, I, I guess uh, they have uh, barges from Portland to uh, Hawaii. They give up the route. So, you, you know, you begin, you know, and then the Star Advertiser cut a, a substantial part of its reporters and, and staff yesterday over the weekend. And so things that we assume are operating okay, may not be. And today we've had a lot of trouble on the, on the telephone systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Some carriers have gone down and you can't make calls to their exchanges. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, in, we're approaching chaos here. And my theory, my theory is that there's got to be chaos, you know, in the internet where you, you assume we all are sort of delighted that it still works, even in the time of COVID where we're locked mm -hmm. in and, uh, and all that. But in fact, you know, there are things happening around cybersecurity that we should know about and sort of fold into our thinking. Can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah, I can talk about it quite a bit. I think that there's, there's the interesting part that you're bringing up with the reliability of the technology that we're actually interacting with um, and the, and how we've kind of reapportioned most of the bandwidth to like residential communities versus commercial and you know, people's Wi-Fi at home is not set up as, as secure in general as, as something that is set up at a you know at, at the commercial location um, but the other part of it is the psychology, the psychology part that I'll speak to is the work that I do a lot on is understanding how our mind works in processing cybersecurity type messages. So, um, so in some situations, or in most situations, we're, we're operating in this automatic processing type mode. Um, it, Daniel Kahneman, a, a Nobel winning uh, a economist, has a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, where he talks about two different modes of, of cognition. And so there's the system one mode, which is like the automatic mode where you're kind of like on autopilot. Um, I wrote a paper about this in relation to cybersecurity uh, last year or two years ago now. Um, and so most of us are operating in that space where we're, we're going from thing to thing, not thinking too much about certain aspects of it. Most of the time, actually the majority of the time. Um, system two cognition is this deliberative cognitive thought, um, which is where we're talking like you and I are talking right now. Uh, so when you're when you're interacting with a like a spear phishing message or you get some weird email from you know you you don't know where or it looks like like we were talking about before uh, that it's an email from a legitimate person that you would be communicating with but it's got a weird address that um, whatever you're going very quickly you're processing in this automatic mode I would get an email uh, from Jay I will I'll I'll, re I'll look at that email and. Um, and if you're not really, really careful about how you how you're responding to that, you could be, you know, subject to a you know, spear phishing message. Um, so the other the other aspect is there is a difference between uh, a utilitarian mindset and a hedonic mindset. Uh, so some of the work we've done with social media, you're in a hedonic mindset most of the time, meaning that you're there for pleasure. You're there to you know, find out what your friends are doing or see what articles are reading or something like that. When you're in the hedonic mindset, you're actually much more susceptible to being, um, basically just being co-opted by something and not even realizing it. Uh, it this, is the tr this is true with cognitive biases as well as uh, just, um, you know, if a cybersecurity event happens on your computer, you might not notice it in the same way that you would notice it if you were using your computer in a utilitarian mindset for purpose, um, like, uh, like, um, like a business related purpose, like doing a product review or, you know, whatever your business might be, right? So. Yeah, so, okay, so 
<clears throat> yeah, if I'm if I'm in business, I'm going to be thinking to protect the business. It's beyond me. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization. And I have a duty, you know, yep. not to let anything sloppy happen on my watch. I'd be criticized if I do. But well, I understand completely about the hedonic thing. So, you know, I'm just schmoozing with my friends. We're exchanging little chatty things, um, maybe passing, passing documents, uh, news article uh, links or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's not serious. And so I don't think too much about it. I don't worry about it. But I told you before the show began that um, uh, one of our hosts got an email ostensibly from me and it had my name. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he looked behind and you can always, you know, like click on the name on the right side of the name and it'll tell you the email of this right. person uh, who sent the email. <clears throat> and it was a, an address, uh, <clears throat> an unintelligible address with a bunch of uh, you know, letters, not, not a name. Yeah. Uh, and then it had the, the FR extension for France. Yep. So I, I don't know anybody by an unintelligible name in France. And uh, it's certainly not me. Yeah, none and, that you can remember anyway, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm, say, I'm saying to myself, um, okay, this has got, and it was, it, was an, it was an innocuous mail they sent to him. And mm -hmm. he was quick enough to spot it because he, he didn't think it was my style, I guess, um, and, and called to my attention. Uh, and then, you know, you get into the question of, so somebody did this, somebody targeted him in order to fool him in some way. Mm -hmm. um, why? And I, and I get to think of these guys that actually go to college to learn how to do this kind of fishing. And they have a big blackboard in their little room down in the basement, which has a scenario about what they say, what you say, what they say, and how they draw you into some kind of scam. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's almost like sleuthing. It's like investigating. So you get this ridiculous email and mm -hmm. you say, oh, OK, well, I'll answer it. It seems hedonic. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're somehow in, you're caught. You're in the yeah. net and you're on the blackboard, you know. Yeah, and with the amount of data that's out there on every one of us, if, if somebody has some, you know, reasonable knowledge about who you are and, and what you, what, what, you know, your, your job is and what, and those types of things, they can lead you into um, a discussion that seems like it could be authentic, especially via the email. Um, and, you know, we're also, I mean, it, it is not, uh, it's not a separate thing that we're also inundated with, you know, this information overload mindset, especially with email where we have so many of them come in that we feel like we have to respond to them right away. Um, I have many <laughs> truths <in> now, but, <laughs> yes, uh, but, but you feel a need to respond right away. So you're, you're trying to, to act and maybe you're having this innocuous hedonic conversation, but with friends about, you know, meeting up for a beer afterwards, your mind's not necessarily going to switch right back to like, Oh, I'm, you know, I need to respond to this other email from perhaps my boss or a supervisor. And, uh, and I need to be very you know, scrupulous about the way I respond to it or who is sending it. Um, and the way that these, the phishing has become targeted uh, at, at various people, uh, it, it, can come from, it, it can come from somebody you know, it can be written in a, very, uh, in, a, in, in a language almost that you would think that they would use. And then there's just, you know, there's just one or two cues. So in terms of um, psychology, uh, there's there's something called the feeling of rightness. And so when this automatic uh, processing is going on, where you're just like running from one step to the other, trying to get through what you needed to get done through the day and not thinking a whole lot about um, specifics, uh, there's this, this kind of at the threshold of con consciousness, this thing called the feeling of rightness. And if if everything falls in line and it seems like what you would expect, you're not going to process it much further. Now, if you have something that falls um, into the category of it doesn't feel quite right, there's something a little bit off about this. Maybe you know Jay uses a word that he usually doesn't use, or makes a typo in a way that he wouldn't uh, that you wouldn't usually make a typo. Then, then the feeling of rightness may go off for somebody that's paying a, a, at least a little bit of attention, and uh, and that would cause more processing of the information, perhaps catch it. So I imagine that's what your what your friend did. Um, but there are probably you know. If they can get one or two percent that are that are in the mindset where they don't catch that, then hey, um, they're gonna they're gonna be able to get some information out of them. 
Yeah, well, that's exactly consistent with with my experience. You know, I I, I look for the feeling of rightness. I look I look for this feeling of um, gratification that I'm doing what I have to do, mm-hmm. that I'm responding all to, to, to people who um, you know need to hear back from me and who will be ticked off at me if I don't get back to them soon. I, I live in that world all day long. Yeah. And so I, yep. I want to just like a tennis game. You know, I get I get the ball, I get the ball back over the net. And every time I do, I feel right. I feel good. There's a gratification there. Right. And the guy at the other end is playing with that, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially if they know enough about you just to be able to do the basics of this person's most likely to respond to, this is the organizational structure in this in this environment. This person is most likely to respond to this spoofed email versus, uh, you know, subordinates or something like that. And uh, information is not hard to find. I mean, it's whether or not, a, how high a risk are you of being targeted by an uh, intelligent hacker versus some AI generated uh, mass phishing attempt, right? Um, so somebody's pulling a few pieces of information together and putting it uh, in an email, they can probably pull uh, quite a few people. Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, mostly about phishing. Why? Why phishing? Because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do fishing. Um, you could just be an ordinary schlub who wants to have fun, maybe harass people or give them a hard time, maybe steal from them. Um, mm-hmm. But you don't have to know that much. And you have, all you have to do is you have to have the blackboard and some psychology on how to handle this. And maybe, as you say, a little background on your target. Right. And, 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 but fishing seems to be the thing to worry about now in the time of COVID because there's more fishers out there than there are rocket science, right? rocket scientists who mm-hmm. know a lot about, you know, hacking into business enterprises. Although I'm sure that still happens and maybe happening even more right now. But let's talk about phishing. You know, what are, yeah. what are my risks here? What, you know, suppose, um, oh, you know, now that, now that uh, we've had this conversation, the guy that got this email from me actually works for the government. Okay. That could be on the blackboard. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be. Um, there could be something that for some reason they are targeting him in particular. Um, there are, you know, if you are a wise uh, person that's trying to do this spear phishing attempt and get into things, uh, get into things you're not supposed to be into, uh, you're gonna be, kind of focused on who you're going to pick as a target. Um, and it could be a bunch of people. You can send these out, you know, thousands of these phishing messages out, um, but you, you might be targeting a certain group or, or something like that. And I think that you're absolutely right. I think um, a lot, when people come into my cybersecurity classes, generally they think uh, a lot of the cybersecurity attacks are like brute force attacks or, you know, penetration type attacking. And, and that's not really as much of what we're seeing going on right now. We're seeing a lot more of the social engineering type attacks like phishing, where you try to where you try to trick somebody into thinking, oh, this is this is from a legitimate source, and then you gain access to their computer in some way, or oh, this this document that I've downloaded came from a reliable location, and then you know it's it's now installed something on your on your computer. So it's it's really about tricking us, because uh, I think we might be the weakest link in the whole process um, into into doing something that's going to compromise our, our system. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but it reminds me of a show, a radio show that Think Tech did 10 or 15 years ago about a guy who went to prison. There are not enough of them um, <laughs> for, for hacking. And his, uh, his MO is really interesting. He would send an email to his target saying, um, you know, do you want, a, you want a free program that'll do this and that? Let us know. And the guy, the target would say yes. Okay. And a few days later, uh, the um, uh, you know the criminal would appear at the um, at the target's door one morning in a UPS outfit, and uh, he would hand him a box, and in the box was a disc. Remember, this is 15 years ago, before you know downloads were common, and, yeah. and uh, the target the target would take the disc, and he would install it. It had instructions, and he would install it on his on his machine. Now they had him. He was part of their you know network. And um, the way this guy got caught was so interesting that he appeared in front of one guy's house one morning with one of these boxes. And the guy opened the door and he, he said, where's your truck? I don't, 
I don't see a UPS truck out there. There's something wrong with this picture. And that resulted in the fellow going to jail. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. I mean, the feeling of rightness was off there. <laughs> I mean, you know, this all plays off people being, you know, uh, being, what's the word, gullible and, uh, and falling for these deals. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, I think right now we're all in the, in the hedonistic, hedonistic category you talked about. And so we have to follow some rules. So you have some rules for us uh, to follow, to sort of screen out where they get us. Because otherwise I think we'd be on the blackboard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the most important thing, or one of the things I've advocated for organizations to do is to, uh, and, and some of them have, have started doing this already, is to send out uh, phishing emails as like tests to see if their their employees will click on them and if they do then they have to go to some training or, or you know they might get locked out of their account for 15 minutes who knows but um it, you can you can put a bunch of different ways into it but in terms of us as uh as the consumers of the the phishing emails and the consumers of the social engineering attacks um it's really about recognizing uh any type of thing that would throw the situation off and so you're getting a you're getting an email. Um, maybe it seems like it's coming from a legitimate person, but just take that extra few seconds to scrutinize it a little bit better. The idea is to improve the underlying heuristics with how we process this type of information. Um, so some of it has to come top down. I know that some of the universities and some businesses now flag emails from external uh, people that are external to the organization. So if I get an email from somebody, um, it might say, this email is coming from somebody outside your organization, pay extra attention. Now, whether or not that actually works is still probably yet to be seen if it really has a measurable impact. But for now, now that it's more of a novel thing, uh, people pay more attention to those now. They say, oh, okay, I have, a, I have a warning. Let me make sure this is coming from the right person. And especially if, you know, like I was talking about you, if my department chair sends me an email um, in a context that was completely expected to happen uh, and asked if I can meet up with him in a few minutes and, and that was all within the realm of something he would normally do. And there was a flag on it that said it was coming from an external member of the organization or somebody outside my organization. I would have been much more likely to catch that. Um, I caught it luckily anyway, but just like barely. Um, but I would have been much more likely to catch it had there been a flag that said, uh, this isn't from your department chair's email account. This is from somebody else's. So, um, so that's the top down side. Now, the other side is just, yeah, you, we got to kind of pay more attention when you're in these modes of like, I just got to like get out these, these emails. I'm, I'm going to respond to like 50 emails. Just triage the ones that, that seem like they're just a little bit out of place that you can look at a little bit closer later. I think would probably be the best, um, best way forward on fishing for, for right now. You can train yourself to do that. Yeah. You can actually, I, I mean, I've been trying to train myself to do it, to, to look at it with a jaundiced eye just for a second and say, does this fall within the, what did you call it, the, the feeling of right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it in these boundaries of what I would normally expect? Or yeah. is it right on the fringe of it? Or is it far away? I mean, like yeah. now if we get an email from somebody in a faraway land is talking about our, you know, aunt that just died, we all kind of have that schematic of, oh, that's most likely not something I should be responding to, but um, but of course the uh, the attackers evolve and they and they get a little bit you know more specific with especially if they have some information on you where they can yeah. be like okay. They well, respond I, to I've noticed too, and uh, maybe it's just me, but in the past mm, 30, 60 days, I have received more junk mail, including a lot of political mail. Mm -hmm. um, then you can shake a stick at it every day. I, it, I, I, my thumb is sore from deleting all of it, <laughs> my index finger, whatever. Um, and uh, it keeps coming at me and everybody wants my email address. Whatever you do, they always get your email address. And then presumably they sell it or give it away to somebody and it travels around the internet probably for price. And, and then you got all yeah. these people who are sending me junk mail. And some of that junk mail is going to be dangerous. Some of it is going to be phishing mail. Yeah. Um, so the question is, and this is a sort of a broader question, is mm -hmm. I'm having trouble managing this. I don't know how to, I tried in the Apple case, I tried to screen it out by saying, you know, mail from this sender, you know, delete it. Oh, um, yeah. don't, don't, I don't want to see it. 
um, that didn't work because uh, then it would be another sender. They, it's like yeah. they're scanning radio frequencies. You yeah. know, as soon as you nail one address, uh, you know, sender, then they got another sender. Yeah, yeah. So you can't you can't get away. They'll be, they'll be on you as long as they have your address. I tried to change my address. That mm -hmm. didn't work either because they found me in no time. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is, you know, how do you protect yourself now? Um, Hawala Grevy, local guy, uh, been successful in something called POW spam. And my law firm used to use that. I, uh, I don't know exactly, you know, what he's doing in the local market right now. Maybe, you know, he's everywhere. I don't know. And, and his, his claim to fame is that he's going to screen out all the, all the spam. Um, but query, do I look at something like that? What do I do to protect myself from this onslaught every day? And in there is there's danger in there. If I have yeah. to look at it all. Well, I think the number one thing, and I and um, this is probably the most important thing you can do to protect yourself is make sure that you have second factor authentication uh, built in. And it's obnoxious, and people don't like it. I mean, people don't like having uh, to do that second step. So the idea of second factor authentication is your password is something you know. And then you have a device that is something with you. It could be a hardware device that you like plug into a USB, or it can be your phone that has an app installed on it, so that you have these two steps of verification. Um, that way, if your email is compromised or an account's compromised because you accidentally fall for a phishing uh, email, uh, you will not have the same amount of damage as if uh, as if if that weren't set up where they could get in and start sending emails from your address. So having that second factor authentication, yeah, when you log into your email from, especially if you're not at a, at a normal computer, you have to have your phone with you. It's like what the bank does with the code that, that, that they text you. Oh, there's a few problems with that. Um, so that's, that's the number one thing you can do to protect yourself. Now, how do you stop the onslaught of information is a completely different um, a different thing. And uh, I, I would say, you know, we, we have spam filters that the University of Hawaii uses and, and stuff gets through it all the time. And, um, and we'll get an email from our, our tech guy and he'll say there was spam, there's been a phishing attempt that's been sent out to the professors. Here you go. But sometimes we don't even get that. And sometimes it is, you know, literally the department chairs uh, being spoofed and they're trying to get uh, something specific uh, in terms of account access or information. And um, and so that other than being vigilant right now and using those spam filters and maybe, you know, with calls, it seems to still work a little bit where you can block the calls and they're starting to put spam filters on calls um, as well. Those things work um, a little bit, but like you said, they're going to find they, they'll find your new address or you're gonna, they're going to they're gonna get through in one way or the other. Um, so it's what you do to protect yourself after um, if you were to accidentally fall for something that's probably more important at this point. You know, I have um, I have a uh, password you know program, mm -hmm. which uh, they tell me that that's very secure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, I feel all that comforted by it because <clears throat> if anybody hacked into it, I'd, I'd have a real big headache. Um, and I wonder if that's adequate or maybe the technology is moving to a point where it becomes adequate, where uh, there's enough security around these password password uh, database type programs uh, that are accessible on the net, right? They, you can you can yeah. find them from any number of machines and, and places. Um, uh, you think you think they're a worthy risk? Because uh, if if I have to remember them or carry around a little yellow pad with all those things, I you know I, I I'm non-functional. I have yeah. to have something like that. Yeah. Right. And the ridiculous thing that cybersecurity professionals like me like advocate use a different password on every site. That's impractical right now. So the best the best advice I can give is triage the site. It's like your bank site should probably have a unique password. Um, whereas the the blog that you randomly post on every once in a while, um, a comment that it doesn't need to be. It can be a common password in, in you know, you don't need to triage that and memorize it. Now, the password managers, I used to, I used to have a different feeling about it um, until a few years ago. Uh, one of them was hacked, and the, it was LastPass, and the way they dealt with it was actually comforting, um, which is they, the two, the, there were, the way that it was just technically set up is that there were two different uh, basically databases, and the one that was breached was the account information, but you couldn't get through to the actual passwords. As soon as they detected that breach, 
they shut all of the accounts down in LastPass, and then they made you go through a, uh, they sent you an email, and they made you go through several different steps to verify that you were you, and that you could have access back to your passwords. Um, so for them, at least, it was it was um, an, a demonstration of what would happen had it been hacked. And since then, I've been a little bit more comfortable because, you know, you see uh, somebody's cybersecurity plan in, you know, in effect, and and that it seems to be effective also having they didn't have any passwords that that got out um, or from it. it. It makes you feel a little bit more comforted in the whole process. You know, in entrepreneurship, which you guys at Shiva talk a lot about. Um, you know, the, the first priority is to find out what the problem is. Uh, and sometimes what the client wants is, may not be the, the real problem. So you have to use uh, Stanford, uh, what do you call design thinking uh, to yeah. figure out what the real problem is. <laughs> okay. But in other cases, the real problem is obvious. <laughs> and you and I today are talking about real problems mm. that, that need to be solved. So one of those problems is um, how I can have easy access, individual access, reliable access, safe access to my passwords. And uh, I've always said that that's the kind of problem where the guy who invents an acceptable solution um, will make Bill Gates look like a biker. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, what kinds of technology do you think will ultimately prevail? Because there will be an answer. Somebody will invent something. Is it uh, the retina in your eye? Is it your, well, we already have fingerprints. I'm not sure that works yeah. really well. Um, what, what do you think will happen here? Because the, the notion of having a password manager, which is a hassle anyway, um, right. and which may not be all that secure like LastPass, mm -hmm. um, you know, it may, may not be a long-term adequate solution. There will be one though, uh, I think, I think, you know, whatever mankind can devise, can devise, mankind can get around too. But Yeah, well, you know, I would love to be the next Bill Gates, but I don't think that's happening anytime <laughs> soon. But, um, but what I would say is that uh, biometrics is, is not the solution, at least in the way that it's being used right now. So like retina scans and fingerprints. Um, what, what happens is that your phone or, or your computer is creating a digitized fingerprint for you, like in in hexadecimal and passing it on. So if that, you know, if that hexadecimal string of characters gets hacked, then they have essentially your fingerprint, right? It's not your real fingerprint, it's a fake one, right? And the same thing can happen with retina, with facial recognition technology. Um, somebody that comes across your phone might not be able to do it very effectively, but in terms of getting through into an account, um, it, having having a you know a fingerprint that gets you, gets you through to it, I don't think is going to be the ultimate solution of where we move from. Now, in terms of um, like wearables and things like that, that it's something like that that could do authentication. I know um, you know my Apple Watch, uh, you know, for for second factor authentication, um, it kind of like the, the uh, Duo app is is the one that UH uses. It comes through on my wrist. I can just hit approve on the second factor authentication, get through into my um, email. And so it's not as where's my phone? I got to pick up my phone and got to bypass the lock on that and then hit the accept button. It's just like I look down at my watch and hit OK. So I mean, it's just I think I think the first step is making that easier and more accessible to more people, uh, something along those lines. And um, I don't know what the innovative solution is going to be. Um, there will be one, though. I mean, because effectively, you know, passwords are are pretty much junk these days. Um, you know, the 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 longer and longer, with quantum computing, you know, we can get longer and longer passwords that are easily hacked. Um, so we've gone to you know, talking about past phrases, which is you put in you know a really long you know, line that you remember or you know, some sort of uh, thing that you have memorized, and uh, and that'll work for a while. But there will be computers that are able to hack through that at some point as well. And so um, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's going to have to be a solution. That the person that comes up with that solution is probably going to be making a lot of money. Yeah, yeah I was thinking of voice voice print, but I think. Uh... You know, voice. You know, the waveform of your voice. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't sound that it would be. Uh, I mean, you can you can. They are copying voice prints all the time. Yeah. There's, there are technologies out there that can copy that. They can create your voice. So I'm not sure that would be you know fail safe. And then of course there's DNA. You know the double helix, which is yeah. unique to you. 
Yep. But but you know, and these days uh, we can we can get a kind of sample of your DNA mm -hmm. so easily. But then so can a third person get a sample of your DNA so easily. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah so and it's being passed through computers, and not like you actually need my my double helix to actually authenticate me. If it's being passed through a digital medium, then that's going to have to be digitized in some way that can be copied. So it's not necessarily. The, the DNA that is going to have to be copied is the whatever the DNA is created, whatever the computer does with the DNA and then passes it along to the server for authentication. So there is something that's in, more interesting um, that's a little bit more dynamic and there's certain behavioral uh, biometrics is what they're called. So like um, there are algorithms that can pick up on, with pretty good accuracy, pick up on your keystrokes and how you type um, oh, on yeah. the computer. And yeah. so the pattern in which you type, the pressure that you're putting down, all these different types of things um, could be used. And that would be much harder to replicate because it's more continuous and it's more, um, there's more, yeah, like I said, more dynamic than just passing, you know, a 256 hash of, of somebody's DNA to, to another computer. Sure, it's the, it's the, uh, the rhythm of your keystrokes, the yeah. way, the, how much pressure you put on your keystrokes. And yeah, yeah. I, I've read about that too. That might be a solution if somebody can come up with it. Yeah, I think so, that was probably more promising then. Yeah. Suffice to say that we are in a time when, um, I mean, this goes larger than just phishing and, for that matter, hacking, even really felonious hacking. Yeah. Um, because we live in a time when, when um, law and order is, is, is under attack and people are going to feel um, that if they can find an opportunity, they can use it. And in truth, you know, I mean, we can speak about this maybe the next time is, um, you know, people who do this sort of thing are usually not caught. They're usually not prosecuted if they are caught. And if they are prosecuted, they don't get, you know, a long sentence as would, you know, deter others from doing the same thing. It's still kind of a gag, I think, mm -hmm. in a lot of jurisdictions. And, yeah, and uh, maybe... Yeah, and there's differences in other, right? Like there's, if somebody's doing something in another jurisdiction, they might, it might be really hard to track them down that, you know, there's a Melissa McCarthy movie, Identity Thief, I mean, that basically talked about that, how the states have different, you know, rules of that. So, yeah. Well, Randy, the, <laughs> the world is our oyster on this. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> and the chaos is, is definitely there, so. Um, so let's let's be on the solution side instead of the okay. more chaos side. Let's do some more. <laughs> Randy Minus, uh, the Shiloh College of Business uh, in Information Systems, a professor of Information Systems, um, who has developed the Master of Science program there. We'll talk again soon, Randy. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Thank you. Aloha.